everyone and welcome to the Berkshire High Peaks Festival which is brought to you by Close Encounters with Music. My name is Carolyn Regula and I will be acting as your host today. All of our sessions are being recorded and will be live streamed on YouTube as well. You'll be able to watch all of our master classes and lectures even after the fact on our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting Close Encounters with Music. The mission of this organization is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting, to connect listeners to performers and composers, and to foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance builds. They also strive to establish a comfortable listening environment and turn performances into intellectually enriching and educational uplifting experiences. So in the chat, that is where you all attending today can communicate amongst yourselves. And in the chat window right now, I will be including the link to donate to Close Encounters with Music. Over the course of our talk today, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which will allow you to submit questions to me, which I will relate to our presenter. For those of you joining us on YouTube, you can use the chat feature during the live stream and I will be monitoring that as well. If you have any issues at all with your Zoom connection, you can join us on YouTube and follow along with the presentation using the link here in the chat. To welcome our presenter, we have Yehuda Hanani. Good morning to our 46 students, to our faculty, to all the friends who are watching and listening from all over. Um, Joan Tower does not need an introduction. She is a leading American composer. And I had the thrill of playing the premiere, the uh, West Coast premiere of her cello concerto. Um, very powerful piece. She's also a formidable pianist. And over the years, we played chamber music together, um, including her trio for Danielle, which is another very, very special moving piece of music. Um, so maybe we can get started right away with my asking a few questions, Joan. Sure. The first one, I want to relate to the global crisis today. So we know that Olivier Messien wrote a major chamber music work, the Quartet for the End of Time, and he was sitting in a prisoner of war camp uh, during the Second World War. And he wrote it in the barrack while, while all, all of Europe was falling apart all around him. And he really believed it was the end of the, the, end of the world. And it influenced directly a, a very important piece of music. How do you think our crisis today, the, the trauma of the pandemic, is affecting you as a composer and the world of music in general? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Yehuda. Uh, I think it's affecting everybody in every possible way because we're redefining the way we deal with time, just daily time. I've enjoyed it very much actually because um, I work at home. As a composer, I don't need 
to be anywhere. I can be at home working. And I've been writing a cello concerto, another cello concerto. And actually it's been going very well. Um, also taking care of my 93 year old husband who's frail um, and cleaning house, which I do as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's it has really affected the way we think about our priorities, what we really want to do. I've heard from many of my uh, player friends, oh, they're doing things that they always wanted to do, but they never had time to do. Uh, and other friends, uh, it's really making us rethink our priorities. And it's challenged us to, to, to be at home dealing with those, basically. I, I think it's gonna create a fundamental change in the way we deal with life in general, actually. Do you think that the fact that so many of us have been isolated in quarantine and not being able to relate to other colleagues, will this affect the way music is written? Do you think that there will be more use of electronic uh, technology of connecting players rather than physically putting them together in one room. Uh, it, it, this has affected players more than composers by far <laughs> because they depend so much on each other to make music. And uh, the orchestra world is, I mean, shut down basically. Right. At least in chamber music, you can, you can try to play together virtually, uh, which I've seen. In fact, I saw a choral conductor, Erica Whitaker, put together like 2,000 singers from around the world. He made that happen. And now that's wonderful because the choral world is suffering also. The orchestra world and the choral world are suffering the most in music anyways, because they can't, they can't do it. But he, he managed to put something together. Yeah. yeah. As it happens, we are also celebrating the 250th anniversary of Beethoven and uh, for all of us, he's really a, a role model of overcoming um, adversity and difficulties. I know that he is your personal hero. I know that you uh, hold him very high and I know that you uh, actually follow, you consider yourself a follower of Ludwig van Beethoven in many ways. Can you tell us what about his work and character that influenced you most so you're not supposed to share that publicly I, I, oh, I don't well, really no. want that yeah. to be known <laughs> no <laughs> uh, he's you are among uh, you're among friends Joan <laughs> oh okay <laughs> I grew up as a pianist and I played a lot of his music and it had a profound effect on me profound mostly because of the architecture of the music the way he his memory works in terms of clear profiles and the way he takes risks within these motivated, what I call motivated architectures. He, I think probably among all the composers that have influenced me had the most significance in that sense. My music doesn't sound like Beethoven at all, but in the architectural motivated structure with risk sense, yes. That's, uh, the idea of taking a um, small fragment and working with it like an architect would mm -hmm. with, with material, with bricks mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. that's how I recognize your music too. You very much uh, construct things the way Beethoven would. Thank you, that's a big compliment. Uh, I, if you program my music at some point, do not, don't, do not put Beethoven on the same program with me, please, especially before me. <laughs> mm -hmm. The next question I have, Joan, is really a, sort of a, a personal question. Yeah. Uh, I was approached by a, a rather well-known composer. He was very eager to get a commission from me. And he said, you name it. You want it short, it'll be short. You want it long, it'll be long. You want it happy, you will get happy. You want it sad, it'll be sad. You just tell me, I'll write it. And it made me think, what is the connection between writing to order or writing by an inspiration of He sounds a little bit desperate to me. <laughs> you know, in other, do you uh, wait? I would, do I you, would never say that. I think, <laughs> but but I think it's important that the performer decide what he wants, or conductor who mm -hmm. says, 
Um, we need a short opening piece. Uh, here's the composer we, we should ask. And then that's what you do. You, it, and, and that kind of commission is very important for us because it gives us a timeline and it gives us a, 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 a room to go into. Right. But yeah. still, what is the relationship between sitting in your, in, at your desk and waiting for the muse to come flying with little wings out of the, from the window or <laughs> sitting down and doing the work? There must be some connection there between the There is a definitely a, there is a co combination there definitely. <laughs> Usually when you when I go for a cup of coffee or I go down to take a bath or something, you know, I mean <laughs> anything to get away from the dead spot. Uh, but it's a it's 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 a job too and you know, it's like you do it and you just wait. It, it takes a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just run into these roadblocks that take a lot of patients to break through. Do you care to tell us a little bit about your evolution as a composer, how you started out, what was the, the road that you took over the years? When you look back, what kind of a perspective do you have on your own development as, as a writer, as a composer? Well, I didn't start composing until I was 18. I was a pianist up to that and beyond. Uh, but uh, I went to Bennington College and they had a very unusual curriculum there that said, we want you to write a piece. And I was like, okay, I'll write a piece. So I wrote a piece. It was a total disaster. And I said, wait, 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 I can do better. I know I can do better. So I spent the next 60 years trying to do better. Uh, <laughs> but I, it was a way into music that was so different than being a performer. And I've been, that curiosity about different ways into music has been very important to me. How, how do you get close to music on, on, on what, with what kinds of activities? So that became an extraordinarily challenging but important road into music for me. If you were to advise a composer a young man or woman who came to you for advice, what would be the few points you would give them? I always give the same advice, start your own group. And you can do that in many ways. We have histories of composers who did that. And a lot of well-known composers started their own group because they, they wanted to have their own vision of music. They wanted to get played by their group. So they had an avenue to grow in. And that's what I did. I started the, the Capo Chamber Players uh, early on. And I grew so fast with that experience. Um, but there are other ways of doing it. You can be a presenter. Like Bang on a Can is a very successful contemporary group that's run by people who don't play. They don't play. But the players play their music and other music too. So, and that they create their own vision with on their own model. So that's my advice is to start your own group and mm. do it any way you can. Let's switch for, switch for a moment to the world of painting and then you can tell me how it relates to uh, your work as a composer. Um, do you believe in a certain progressive uh, progression when it comes to uh, educating a young composer? Uh, should a painter begin by playing figuratively, by, by playing, by, by drawing figuratively, by being able to have the, the skills of, of being a representational painter before they become abstract painters? Or should they right away start throwing paint at the canvas? In other words, is there any technique and, and a lot of exercises that, that, that a composer should, should be able to, to go through before they sit down to write? Or can you just go straight to it? That's a very complex and tough question because it, every young person is different. Some require that steadfast, systematic, you know, learn this, learn that, then compose. Others will rebel from the get-go. They don't want to do that. They want to start their own music right away. And it, it's, it can be successful on both sides. But at some point, they have to yield to the other side. <laughs> In other words, the systematic people have to develop their own voice, which means they have to let go of a lot of things they've learned. And the other way 
the intuitive type has to learn some skills in order to improve their craft. So it's co very complex and, it, and it's a very separate avenue for whoever that person is. Well, to, to rephrase my question, do you have to be able to master the rules before you break them? Or can you start right away that. by being an anarchist and saying the hell with the rules, here I am and I'm doing whatever I want? In music, that's a very complicated question, especially in education. Um, I have students who have gone through the serious Chinese training of learning counterpoint and, and solfege and everything else, but they could no more write a piece that's interesting than fly to the moon. And I have the opposite. I have people who write really interesting music, but to ask, ask them to, to put it in or, orchestral form or, or to, the notation becomes a problem sometimes. It, mm -hmm. it, it goes many ways. I, I, I don't think you need, I don't think you should box in a young student with a lot of so you never, yeah so you never require them to be able let's say to write a chorale in the bach style well you learn about bach by doing that if you're serious about learning about bach then that's what you should do or if you're serious about uh renaissance counterpoint music music of renaissance learn the counterpoint of the rules there are big rules there uh fine it teaches you about that music and, and I think that's an important thing to do as a player or as a conductor. As a composer, it becomes more complex because you can get buried inside those rules and you can't get out. Mm. What about the knowledge of the, the various instruments? Uh, that's very important to know. Uh, and and how, you, how do you do that? By being around those instruments, not through the books. The books are very difficult. Yeah. Because it, it, they don't make sense to me as a composer. It's to, you should be around. I tell my students, go to the studio of so and so if you're writing for violin, and just sit there and listen to violin music and follow the score, and see what the bowing is doing and the dynamics and the range. Yeah. For example, uh, there's a book by Schoenberg with exercises, a counterpoint, and all that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Would you recommend it to your students, or is it passé? I, I think it, it, it's like baking a cake. If you get a great recipe from somebody that says, okay, this is the way to bake a great cake, it uh -huh. will bake a great cake, but it's not your cake, it's somebody else's cake. <laughs> and, and, and that's not such a problem in cooking, but it's more of a problem in, in making music. Now, one more question about the relationship of the composer to the audience. Um, we know that Beethoven towards the end of his life said, I'm going my own way. If you follow me, it's fine. If you don't follow me, it's just as fine. I couldn't right. care less. Yes. I'm going my own way. Yep. What would you say about that? I mean, what is your relationship to the public as a composer? Well, see, Beethoven grew up as an improviser. He, he improvised at these salons. He, he was a fantastic improviser. And that's how he developed his chops, by improvising, by listening, by trying different things, the same way good jazz players do. Mm -hmm. Or any good, a lot of good composers, Mozart, a lot of good composers. Um, Bach, Bach was a major improviser. You know, they developed their craft through doing it. So towards the end of his life, he had developed a major sense of where he was with his voice and what he was interested in. So he could say, I'm going this way, but I know you're not going to follow me tough. You know, he could say that at that point. See, mm -hmm. and he wrote some fantastic music at that point, too. Risky right. as all hell. You know? Right, right. Is the fact that you were a brilliant pianist? Did it have an effect on your writing? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> because <clears throat> I, I, I compose at the piano. I play everything I write. Yeah, I write everything at the piano because- You write at the piano and-, and uh, Yeah, because I want to live it <clears throat> in time. I don't want it to be a concept that doesn't have a temporal, uh, visceral meaning. Great. Joan, I, I think I see our friend Peter Zazowski 
Uh -oh. uh, looking at me from his <laughs> frame over there. And uh -oh. I know that you have a long relationship too. And uh -oh. so maybe we should let him ask a few questions. Uh oh, are you allowing that man, man in? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Peter. Morning. Good morning, Yehuda. Good morning, Joan. Good You're morning, Peter. Surprise. It's so great to see you. Yeah, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we will meet in person soon, masked or not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, right now I'm in um, in Stockbridge, only an hour away from you, and uh, so th you know this is uh, at the same time it's frustrating not to be hugging each other and and being close to each other in person. Um, there are many, obviously, many good sides to this uh, peculiar world we are in now. Um, neither, no one, I think, among the three of us could have imagined such a uh, circumstance turning the world, our world, and the whole world upside down in such a dramatic fashion. So um, I am, of course, fascinated with your report, which I've heard from other composers, uh, that this is... Uh, is, is Sa sacrilegious to say a great time to be a composer uh, you you just said that and uh, you know we can understand it because the creative process is internal you are very much an internalized person in this moment as all composers are so it really does uh, as you said your focus is so uh, you know as like we're staring into this screen and we're focusing on the screen. Uh, that's what we do in our individual lessons, as Yehuda would say as well. I was doing that last night with a Korean student at midnight, uh, totally focused on the experience of seeing that person through the screen and, and understanding their, uh, their motivation, how they play. It's, it's different, but it, it is possible to actually affect uh, a change in a good way for students and I'm wondering what you're doing with composing students during this time well nice to see you Peter Peter's been my brother for years and years actually helped me a lot with the violin and the string quartet world which I got initiated in through the Muir um, um, what was the question <laughs> sorry <laughs> Talking around the point so much that, that you can't tell to end what the beginning is. <laughs> he was famous for that in his writing. Uh, but what I want to ask you specifically is how does the, all of this affect your teaching of your students? Oh, yeah. So in March, I started teaching online and, and, and I took this class and I taught them individually. And that was fantastic for a while because we talked, I would play and we would go back and forth about their solo pieces. We were writing solo pieces and some duets and it was great. We really got into it. And then it came the time to play these pieces. And then things got really hairy because the sound was terrible. And oh, finally I had to get two high tech people in my classes to figure out how to make the sound work. And then we had a hugely nice little recital of all the pieces at the end so it it, it worked at the end but it, it it was very time consuming and i had to adjust to the technology and everything but it, it actually works i'm going to do that i'm going to some of it in the fall did you do any teaching that was group oriented zoom like no. oh well yes the last class we have played our pieces there were 10 in the class, 10 in the class. And that worked, it, it worked, but it took a lot of technology to make it work. How about you? Um, a private lessons were uh, on Zoom or FaceTime. Right. And enough, um, a student in China, um, the, the most successful had two in China. Uh, was actually FaceTime. FaceTime, not, right. Not WeChat yeah. was very slow, cumbersome, and late. But then uh, FaceTime worked much better for a student from China. I was very, very surprised. Yeah, I was too. China and, and also Europe too. I was dealing with Moscow also. Hmm. Yeah. It seems, it seems that the, the hardest thing when you teach in Korea or in China is 
also in this country at this point, is playing together or playing a, a bass line while they are playing or playing yeah. any, any, this yeah. is not doable and this is quite frustrating. Right, because you have, you have to have somebody who knows how to put them together. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. John, another question about the relationship of your work or other composers' works to time, <clears throat> the test of time, let's call it. You take a piece by, by Bach that was written 300 years ago, and it still feels like it was written yesterday. It has all the, 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 so the life force in it that does not need any explanation or any analysis or any historical background. You play it and people react, people respond. Other pieces of music, without knowing the, the, the historical framework, are, are not making it. Uh, I, I even dare to include Shostakovich in this, in this group, unless you know the political stress and, and the Stalinist horrors and all that, something is missing. You, you may have the wrong reaction to his music. What do you think of that? And how do you see, it's very hard to predict, but how do you see your music a hundred years from now? Well, I would like this to segue into the question I want to talk about, which is where are living composers welcomed? Great. Okay. Uh, because this does kind of feed into that. I'm learning a piano program right now because I have the time by Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, Debussy, and a jazz piece. And I'm memorizing it because it's good for the brain. And I, I play better from memory. And I'm just in awe of these composers, how strong they are with time, with register, with uh, harmonic sequences, with timbre, with the whole, I'm just, I haven't played these people for in a while. And it's just wonderful to see just how, why they are still living. This is because everything they do, the complexity of, of the picture of music is presented in this very strong temporal narrative uh, in different ways. Bach is very different from Beethoven. Right. Beethoven is much more expansive in every sense than Bach, you know, time-wise, register-wise, dynamic-wise, everything. Bach is confined, but in the confinement, he, he does the same thing in a way that Beethoven does, it, it, it's just fascinating to me. Um, so I think, I think, you know, some of my music lives on because it's stronger than other pieces that they die. I have three types of pieces. I have uh, my boring children that don't go anywhere. I have my delinquents who perform beautifully at certain times and terribly at other times. <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, my stars that perform 90% of the time pretty strongly. So, and I'm very aware of the difference of, of these people, um, these, uh, these pieces, sorry. Yeah, and so, so the history of, of things has to do to me with the strength of the piece. Sometimes it has to do with the medium. Like some mediums for composers, and I will now talk about the welcoming thing. I've traveled through every musical instrument almost, uh, except for bass, which I'm about to do, and, and horn, which I'm a little fuzzy on. Um, but, and choral music, uh, vocal music, I've sort of stayed away from, um, except for one song and two core pieces. Uh, um, some worlds I don't, I won't talk about, but it, all the other worlds I, I know pretty well. And what I've noticed is that some instruments are so welcoming to us living composers that you're just a natural part of their fabric. And you, you guess who the first one really is. What instrument do you think would be the most welcoming to composers? based on what they've been doing. Anybody? Peter, Hello? Yehuda, Yehuda? No. In your case, would it be the piano? No. no. Cello. No. Not cello? No. Marimba. 
<laughs> well, the marimba is now taking off as, as because there are much more players coming in and they're asking right. people. They they stole a lot of the guitar world, but because it's the same space. But uh, no, the flute. The flute has commissioned more music than any, any other instrument, any by far. Mm -hmm. And when you go to their convention, there's like this huge amount of new music, all kinds, experimental, traditional, you name it. Can and you young, can you young flutists are playing, old flutists are playing, commissioning. It's just, you walk in there, you're just another musician as far as they're concerned. You're not something kind of out of the ordinary, right? So that they 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 get the Nobel Prize for welcoming the most the, the most welcoming of all the instruments. Next would be percussion, and that's exploded in this in these in this uh, recent century. And now we have lots of really good percussionists, and they're constantly asking for music or even composing. A lot of them are composing themselves. So that, that's that's also a very welcoming world. And third, the clarinet world is, is doing pretty well. Um, and then you go down from there. <laughs> and some worlds, I'm not gonna say which ones, are still very leery about composers. Oh, I don't I don't I don't do that. I don't know any composers, you know, they're just leery. And then we have the ensemble worlds. Um, I think the string quartet is a wonderful world for composers because the string quartets are like four composers. They're, you go into the room and they're immediately thinking about, now I've got to change this, we've got to change that. Maybe on the string, off the string. They're really thinking creatively with you as, as the composer. You, you, you cease to be the, quote, authority on page and more of a colleague composer trying to make a musician trying to make this piece work uh, so that's a, that's a pretty inviting world and although they still are a little bit hesitant about commissioning that's it's gotten better it's gotten better but it's it's work and the trio world is is done a lot of work work to so the piano trio world has commissioned a lot of music too although there are less of them a lot less of them than string quartets uh, um, and then the band world is a fantastic world. They love composers. They do these consortium commissions. They treat you like a rock star when you come in. And they, they're wonderful. Play of oh, some of these bands are fantastic players. It's, of course, competitive. So they, they, it's going up like the string no. quartet world. Well, um, while you're the orchestra while you're world is tough. While you're what? talking about band music, while you're talking about band music, why right. don't you tell us about this piece of yours that has been played by what, 70, 80 different bands all over the country? No, that's an orchestra piece. <laughs> but it's called like... Ma Made in America. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a chamber it's a chamber orchestra amateur community orchestra commission consortium of 65 orchestras that played this piece that was an amazing experience yeah and you wrote it specifically for amateurs so you didn't make it too difficult to play no they commissioned they thought this was a great project for community orchestras uh the asol uh the sorry the symphony orchestra league made this happen all, all across 50 states and it was deliberately uh, directed towards community orchestras, some of which were pretty professional and some which were very amateurs. So, so I had to write it, write it so that they could all play it. Fabulous, fabulous. A question about world music. You know, with the world becoming so mm -hmm. much smaller and with us being able to communicate like this on a screen with every country, every possible country, we have instruments that we never knew about before. We have the Chinese pipa. We have uh, the Indian tabla. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, 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 you think that these instruments are gonna be incorporated into our more traditional repertoire of composition and playing? Well, you have to have leadership there in the, in the, in the infrastructures of the schools. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm next door to the China Institute. My my office is we have a China Institute at Bard, 
run by uh, Tan Dun. Well, Tan Dun is the, the uh, conservatory director, but there's an institute. So I'm starting to learn because she's right next door uh, right. about these different instruments. It's going to take a while to, to incorporate them into the same kind of thinking that we have. That's a, that's a kind of, because their thinking is way over there somewhere, like jazz. Jazz is, is very different too. But we're trying to get that into the same. Uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because the, the, uh, the ideas are so different. Mm -hmm. We are considering a commission now that will include a rap singer. What do you think of that as a way of sort of bringing two different cultures? I think together? it's great. Hey, <laughs> think outside the box. Yeah. And see what happens if they <laughs> fall flat on his face, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but give us, give it a break. Yeah. yeah. You can't keep playing my favorite composers only. You know what I mean? You need some air coming in to challenge them. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. Joan, can we have the pleasure of hearing some of your works with yes, your you know, some that, background on them? Okay. Um, and then we'll have questions from people, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of, I'm going to cut it off. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> he died many years ago. No, can we start at the beginning, Beth? Hello, Beth. Can you start it at the beginning? <laughs> Thank you. This is a sounds okay but that's an early early work of mine called Petrush Gates which is played a lot uh, it was written in 1980 and it's um an homage to my influences it's a, a Petrushka that I played with many years for many years and I just wanted you to get a flavor of that the next piece is much later. It's for solo viola, and it was played. It's played by Paul Neubauer, who I've written four pieces for for viola, and I'm now president of the Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Violists. <laughs> you musicians will understand that joke. You know, there's like a thousand books on the viola, <laughs> but um, yeah. So this piece is called Wild Purple. And in, it's 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 uh, Paul Neubauer. Can you start at the beginning, uh, Sarah uh, Beth? Thank you.
Thank you. That's uh, about half of the piece. It's a virtuosic viola piece. It gets harder, much harder, but Paul uh, is a player and he, he somehow goes very well. Uh, he told me that the last page is almost impossible to play. A, a, a characteristic that a lot of players forget, they forget to tell the composer that this is impossible. Um, <laughs> because they don't, they don't want to be the person who can't do it, you know what I mean? So, but it's been played a lot. And I think it's partly because violists are hungry for solo repertoire and it's challenging and it works on a, works pretty well, actually. I'm, 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 I like this piece, uh, so. And so the, the last piece, which I will play, is for another composer, another, uh, sorry, another player who I've worked with a lot. And that's, a, a, um, oh no, no, that's not the right one. Well, okay, okay. We're gonna play a string quartet of mine uh, called White Water. And this is the Daedalus Quartet who does a beautiful job with this piece, really first rate. And uh, so I'll play a little bit of this. It's basically about going up.
Bravo, Joan. Beautiful music. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's a, about a 17 minute piece, but it's beautifully recorded and played. It really is. Mm. I take my hats off to that quartet. <laughs> yeah. So um, do you want to start the question and answer period now? Let me ask one more question. Oh, okay, sure. You, you played uh, quite a bit of your music on, for piano and piano ensemble by yourself. Have you ever conducted any of your works? Yeah, I, I got the conducting bug at some point because I was traveling around with a conductor uh, to different orchestras and I noticed that the same piece, it was a different performance by the, each orchestra. And I never, I've, I've worked with a lot of conductors. I never understood the relationship of a conductor to an orchestra. So I said, well, I'll just take it up myself and figure that out myself. So I did. I took it up and I conducted for a while. I even did some traditional repertoire badly. Um, <laughs> but I learned that relationship. And um, I think it's an important thing to do for composers to do at some point in their I life. I remember because, in Aspen, when we did your concerto, you preferred not to conduct it. Well, I wasn't ready for that group. <laughs> no, I, no, I wasn't ready. No. Yeah. Sorry, you did a great job with it, though. But 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 you do conduct your works. My own works, yes. Not yeah. I don't do Beethoven anymore. Oh, mm -hmm. yikes! Too hard. Yeah. I, I, you know, I remember that Aaron Copeland every now and then was asked to conduct his works and. I was his soloist in one of the concerts, and he said to me, I don't know why they asked me to conduct my music. Lenny does it so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm sure he did. <laughs> Lenny spent a lot more time at it than he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Peter, do you have any other questions that you want to ask? Well, so many, uh, <laughs> so many questions. Um, you were mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you categorize your children, your pieces, your children maybe, um, as, um, you know, hits or problem children or, or what were the other descriptions. Uh, what happens when you get a request from, let's say, a trombone player to play one of your problem children? How do you deal with that? <laughs> Oh, I told you that story already about the trombone. Oh, yes, yeah. but yeah. why don't you, yeah. you tell all of us this story? Uh, well, I wrote this piece for John Swallow and the Cleveland Quartet, and uh, it was played, and it was in a, mor a memorial for his wife, and everybody was crying, and everybody came back and told me what a great piece it was, and and everything, and I was like sitting there going, "This is a disaster." Now, so then another trombonist found it in Scotia festival very good canadian trombonist alan Tr trudell was his name i think he played it same thing everybody went nuts they loved the piece and of course he's a great trombone player and everybody, oh then it was played in pittsburgh by the one of the trombones in the symphony same thing happened all, all through this i was piece working so i put it on the shelf and this israeli Come trombones called me up. He said, "Miss Tower, oh, this is a uh, Chaim Abitzer. Uh, I'm doing your masterpiece, the uh, elegy for trombone and string quartet. It's a masterpiece." And I was like, "Oh no, oh no!" And I had to tell him that I had shelved it, and he was like, absolutely dumbfounded by this. He said, "This is not acceptable." I said, "How many pieces are in the repertoire of trombone and string quartet?" And he said, "There are five. And I, I've played them all, and yours is by far the best. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, the others must be really bad. <laughs> so that's my trombone story. <laughs> there was a piece for unaccompanied cello that I found by Christopher Rouse long ago. And then I met him and I said, I have this piece of yours. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, I never wrote it. I disowned it. <laughs> did you ever? And, <laughs> and did you ever... like? Did, did you like the piece? I did. I thought. Well, it was see, a... see, that that's the problem. 
<laughs> Did you, you ever... as a composer, you cannot say that. It's not fair. It's not fair to the player who's worked very hard on it and loves it. It's just not fair. You just have to keep your mouth shut about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever destroy a piece that you wrote? I have shelved three pieces, yeah, three. Yeah. When you say shelved, you mean you're waiting for them to be rediscovered at a certain point or do you want them to actually be forgotten? Well, I don't, uh, I don't want to abandon them. I don't want, I want them to be abandoned children entirely. You know, so I, some in the back of my mind, I think maybe someday I'll get around to improving them. So that they're, they're just shelved. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can find out from Carolyn if there are any questions from our listeners. Carolyn, are you there? I am. And Joan, you have seven questions Whoa. for the audience oh <laughs> today. Wait a minute, um, I gotta go get them. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting ready. Um, so temporarily, I will mute Yehuda Hanani. Um, so we only get Joan's audio. And this has been going on throughout the talk today. So we'll get to revisit some older themes, which is great. First one comes from Jonathan Swartz. What themes are you and other composers going to focus on in the post pandemic world? I have no idea. It depends on what I'm asked to do. Sorry, short answer, sorry. That's okay. Um, G. Troy, sorry, G. Troy asks, Going back to architecture of Beethoven's music, can you recommend few pieces for young composers to dig in? All his music is amazing, but as a starting point or pieces that you're keen on. Thanks. Uh, young by young composers, she wants a recommendation for young composers to listen to or to play. I wasn't quite sure. I believe she means um, pieces for young composers to listen to by Beethoven for them to get inspired or learn about um, structures of music. So for listening. Well, I guess uh, it depends on the age, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, I would take Beethoven's seventh um, symphony and um, um, maybe one of the, if they play an instrument, a string instrument, maybe one of the cello sonatas, the last one maybe, or the violin sonatas or the Archduke trio. I would start with the strong pieces. Why start anywhere else? Yeah. Oh, oh, that piano, the piano pieces, uh, Opus 111. Excellent, excellent. Um, Walter Herrera asks, why is it so complex in a few cases to understand the music of a new composer in the on the public side? So for a public listener, um, the complexity of music of a new composer um, and the difficulties in understanding. First of all, I don't think all the music is complex. There's some very simple, straightforward music out there. They, they, everybody seems to think that new music is complex and dissonant and hard to get to. It isn't. There's a, you just go on YouTube and, and, and listen to Avo Parrot, for example. Very simple, slow, slow beautiful, meditative music. Or message fantastic. Okay, it's a fantastic piece. A lot of the minimalist composers, you know, like John Adams, very listenable music. It, it uh, uh, it's not all dissonant and complex music. That's a myth. Myth. Uh, you're muted, Carolyn. Oh, I know, Joan. I just want to give you the full spotlight while you answer. Um. Our next question is. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Oh, okay. Um, our next question is from Prisha Ray, and I think we are going to pause momentarily. Um, we are having a technical difficulty with Joan. Um, we are going to work and try to get her on. Hold on for a moment, please. Thank you. 
I will uh, uh, play one of her pieces while we're waiting for her to rejoin. Oh, here she is. Can you hear me, Kelly? Yes, I can hear you, Joan. Oh, because uh, I it just went it died for a while there. Yeah, you're breaking up just a little bit. Have, uh what was your question? The next question, Carolyn? John, are you able to turn on your video? Yeah, I think it's on. It's not on? No. Is it? No, it's not on? Yeah, it's not. Okay. I don't know what to turn on. We see you, Joan. Well, what do I turn on? Oh, you see me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, in the future, if this happens again, maybe we can answer the rest of the questions via audio. But for okay. now, continue. Okay. Okay, so from Prisha Ray, um, when and how did you get your start in music? I know you addressed this in the beginning, but maybe just a quick recap. Sure. Uh, uh, I didn't, I was a pianist at, at 18 when I went to Bennington College. I was asked to write a piece and that started a whole different way into music that became so fascinating to me. And so I, I kept going. And I also suggest that to all performers, compose, compose once in your time. It'll give you a whole new insight into that page that you're playing. Did you hear that? Are you there? <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. Um, our next question is from Avery Chu. Did you ever blend different genres of music with classical music when composing? And if so, how did you maintain the soul or fundamental idea of classical music? I don't know what they mean by classical music. And by blending, I mean, there's so many kinds of classical music. I'm not sure what that means. And by blending other genres, are they talking about adding theater or voice or jazz? I'm not sure what the question, I, I just don't know how to answer it. I have, the only thing I've done multidisciplinary is uh, dance. I've, I've done a ballet with somebody, we created it together. And I've had six other pieces uh, danced too, but that's basically the only other thing that's come into my music. Excellent. Um, David Sabo asks, what are some ways one can start to create their own group? Where does the funding eventually come from? And this was when you had mentioned, <laughs> st I know, um, when you had mentioned starting a group. Yeah, that's a good question. My first answer to that is don't start with fun. Funding. Start with the group. The group has to be a group before it can be funded. It, it's hard to start a group in a vacuum. I was on the New York State Council of the Arts for several years and they asked me, okay, we're going to start a chairman music program. When do you think you should come in for a group? It was a very difficult question. For Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to bring back Joan, I believe, on audio only to help with her connection. 
Um, one moment, please, while we help her out. Thank you. Hello, Joan, can we hear you? Oh, we're back. I'm back. <laughs> yes, Joan, I believe we're gonna have you stay with I don't audio. Hear you. Can you stay with us on just uh, audio, please? To finish uh, questions? How do, where do I start? Um, we can hear you. Yeah, but I need to hear right now. you guys. I want. I'm just uh, going to play a piece of Jen's music while we're seeing if we can resolve the issue. that Joan is back. <laughs> Hopefully you can you can hear us and speak. <laughs> I guess we should probably say goodbye, right? This is sort of not working too well. Yes, I think so. Oh, there, Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should I say thank you, goodbye? <laughs> sure, Joan. Thank you so much for taking the time thank, to thank indulge us with your musical world. Very fascinating for everyone. Thank you. And thank you for being such a great hostess. And sorry about the technology, you know, and I love seeing my good friend Peter and Yehuda too. Thank you, Yehuda, for those tough questions. <laughs> um, every Have a great festival. Oh, thank you, Joan. And speaking of Peter Zazowski, he has a violin masterclass coming tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. So if you guys want to tune in and hear more violin music, like what Joan recommended, listening to more string music, um, Peter's masterclass would be an excellent way to do so. Thank you all so much again for attending our talk today. One more time, this is for the High Peaks Festival and as a part of Close Encounters with Music. And if you are interested in learning more and supporting this organization, I just included the donation link one more time.
Thank you all so much, and we will see you for the next presentation. Bye. Bye. of attendees left. Um, goodbye, Holly. Goodbye, Jonathan. Thank you. Hi, Carolyn, if you can hear me, if you can unmute. Um, yes, Peter, we're just closing the broadcast for one quick second, okay? Okay, I'm not here. I'll wait. Thank you.